Thank you for standing by and welcome to the Yum China third quarter 2023 earnings conference call. I would now like to hand the conference over to Michelle, Michelle Shen. Please go ahead. Thank you, Zach. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Yum China's third quarter 2023 earnings conference call. On today's call are our CEO, Ms. Joey Watt, and our CFO, Mr. Andy Young. I'd like to remind everyone that our earnings call and investment materials contain forward-looking statements, which are subject to future events and uncertainties. Actual results may differ materially from these forward-looking statements. All forward-looking statements should be considered in conjunction with the cautionary statements in our earnings release and the risk factors included in our filings with the SEC. This call also includes certain non-GAAP financial measures. You should carefully consider the comparable GAAP measures. Reconciliation of non-GAAP and GAAP measures is included in our earnings release. You can find the webcast of this call and a PowerPoint presentation on our IR website. Now I would like to turn the call over to Joey Wa, CEO of Young China. Joey? Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. We held our investor day in September in Xi'an, China. It was wonderful meeting investors face to face. At the event, we unveiled our LGM 2.0 strategy with a strong focus on growth. We have set ambitious growth targets for the coming three years. These include reaching 20,000 stores by 2026, achieving double digit EPS CAGR and returning $3 billion to shareholders in dividends and share repurchases. With our long-term growth com uh, commitment in mind, let's zoom into the third quarter. Our results reflect continued strength. Third quarter, net new stores, revenue, and adjusted operating profit all reached record levels. We accelerated new store openings with 500 net new stores in the quarter while maintaining healthy store payback period. Our portfolio now exceeds 14,000 stores. System sales grew 15% year over year in constant currency. Adjusted operating profit excluding temporary release grew 21% year over year in constant currency. In the first nine months, adjusted operating profit exceeds $1 billion U.S. dollar. Our team's relentless efforts produced these remarkable results. To drive sales in the peak summer trading season, we bolstered crew resources for excellent service, ensured supply pipeline readiness, and execute uh, traffic driving campaigns. Simple sales growth in the third quarter was led by strong transaction growth. During the summer holidays, Simto sales at our tourist and transportation locations surged more than 50% year over year. It's important to remember, though, that consumers have continued to be cautious in their spending. Our formula to capture sales growth has always been simple. The food, the fun, and exceptional value. Now let me go through what we have done. First, food innovations on a big scale. Our $100 million club showcase at Investor Day illustrates our success in building huge categories to boost sales. Recent innovations at KFC include our juicy whole chicken and beef burger. To put things into perspective, in the third quarter, these two categories combined exceed 6% of KFC sales mix. This is higher than our original recipe chicken, which we have been proudly serving in China over the past 36 years. It shows the, our ability to innovate, but also build very big categories. We are continuing to expand these categories with new flavors like Sichuan style spicy whole chicken, Tuanxiang Yanba Ni Zi Quan Ji, offering it from Friday to Sunday only. This spicy whole chicken is perfect for a home consumption. 
We also collaborate with Ultraman, Ultraman to promote our premium Ultra G 2.0 beef burger. 瀑布芝士芝士二点零滋滋厚牛堡 Consumers love them. At Pizza Hut, we sold over 100 million pizzas in the first nine months of the year. One out of every five pizza we sold was a durian pizza. That's over 20 million durian pizza, nearly 70 percent more year over year. Our in-house supply chain worked with suppliers to secure durian supplies and expand capacity to satisfy the growing demand. Second. We are offering our customers amazing value for money on top of the innovative food. KFC Crazy Thursdays, 疯狂星期四 is no longer just a marketing campaign. It has become a cultural phenomenon. Crazy Thursday sales consistently outperformed other weekdays in the third quarter by around 40 percent. To keep customers engaged. We rotate offers and regularly launch new flavor variations such as spicy nuggets, 爆火椒麻鸡块 We chose products that utilize existing ingredients and involve simple cooking process to provide exceptional value while ensuring operational efficiency. At Pizza Hut, we are expanding our selections for pizzas priced below 50 RMB. Which is a very significant portion of the overall pizza market. Around 20% of our pizzas we offer are priced below 50 RMB, and that's not enough. We could do more. By enriching our lower-priced pizza offerings, we are tapping into this substantial opportunity that's currently underserved by Pizza Hut. Other than pizzas, we are adding new snacks. That customers love. Our new cheese tart, 芝士蛋挞 became our best-selling snack in September, and an amazing traffic driver. Not easy for a snack item to be traffic driver compared to pizza. Next, keeping users engaged and having fun along the way. Our loyalty programs topped 460 million members in Q3. Up 15% year over year. Notably, sales from members continue to be high at 65%. We collaborate with pop culture icons that resonate with young generations. KFC's campaign with Hong Kai, Star Rail, Xinchong, Tiedao, a popular e-game, generated huge social buzz and attract many new customers. Almost 40% of traffic generated from the campaign came from new or inactive members, and a significant portion are young adults, and that's a fantastic news for the brand. We are proud to be exclusive Western food catering supplier for the Asian Games in Hangzhou. Over 250 of our crew members from across China were chosen to serve at the sporting event. KFC and Pizza Hut set up nearly 30 pop-up stores and served over 1 million athletes and fans. And it shows that our food is good enough and healthy enough for the professional athletes too. We also ran nationwide campaigns, offering exclusive gifts at our restaurants and through our super app in celebration. In closing. I want to thank all of our teams for their hard work in delivering a strong quarter. Next week, we will hold our RGM convention for our restaurant general managers. This marks the first in-person convention for 13,000 attendees since 2019. Very excited about it. It's an excellent occasion to honor our RGM's dedication, celebrate our achievements, and reaffirm our goals. For the coming year and beyond, looking forward, the growth potential in China remains vast, even with moderate economic growth. RGM 2.0 provides us the strategic framework to grow sustainably, evolving consumer preferences in the post-pandemic environment require us to stay agile and vigilant. Our robust supply chain and innovative digital ecosystem has enabled us. 
to quickly adapt to changing market conditions. I'm confident we can continue to create long-term value for our shareholders. With that, I will turn the call over to Andy. Andy. Thank you, Zhou And hello, everyone. Uh, let me share with you our third quarter performance. Uh, but before I do that, I want to point out foreign exchange had a negative impact of approximately 6% in the quarter. Overall, we achieved solid results growing across key metrics. On a year-over-year -year basis, revenue grew 15% and adjusted offering profit grew 10% in constant currency. Compared to pre-pandemic levels, we have a much larger stock portfolio. Although same stock sales remain at approximately 90% of 2019 levels, system sales grew 22% compared to 2019. With that, let's go through the financial in more details. Third quarter total revenues were $2.91 billion in reported currency, a 9% year-over-year increase. In constant currency, total revenue grew 15%. System sales also increased 15% year-over-year in constant currency. The growth was mainly driven by new unit contributions and same-store sales growth of 4%. Dine-in sales continue to rebound year-over-year. Year. By brand, KFC same-store sales grew 4% year-over-year. A strong rebound at transportation and tourist locations contributed to the growth. Same source traffic grew 9%, while ticket average decreased 5%. These results were mainly driven by successful traffic driving promotions, lower delivery mix, and rebound of the breakfast day pot. Delivery typically carries a higher ticket average than dining orders. Thus, a decline in delivery mix lower the overall ticket average. Breakfast orders tend to have a lower ticket average as well. So the rebound in breakfast sales contributed to traffic growth, but lower ticket average. Please note that overall ticket average in the third quarter was similar to the second quarter and higher than 2019. These are same store sales grew 2% year over year. Same store traffic grew 12% and ticket average decreased 9%. We want to highlight that by design. We are expanding our price ranges to enhance Pizza Hut's value propositions and to capture the underserved market. Consistent with Pizza Hut's revitalization plan, we want to enhance Pizza Hut's value proposition to consumers. Particularly, we are targeting the sub-50 RMB pricing range, which represents a very significant segment of the pizza market in China. We also intend to increase the sale mix of delivery and off-premise dining over time. For Pizza Hut, delivery sales generally have a lower ticket average than dining. Finally, we aim to bolster the sales of single-person meals. This is different market segment compared to Pizza Hut's existing customer base, which tends to be group or family dining. Restaurant margin was 17%, 180 basis points lower than the prior year. This was mainly due to lapping of last year's temporary relief of $30 million, which translates into 120 basis point margin impact. Excluding this impact, year over year, year over year, uh, margin change is only 6 uh, base, uh, 6, 60 basis point. Racial inflation normalizations uh, of staffing at the store level, increased promotional activities also impacted margins. On a positive side, uh, occupancy and other expenses improved year over year, primarily due to sales leveraging and ongoing benefit of cost structure rebase, uh, rebasing efforts. Now let's go through the key items. Cost of sales uh, was 31.1%, 40 basis points higher than the prior year. We increased promotional activities to drive traffic sales, uh, sorry, drive sales. And we also faced higher poultry prices in the quarter. This was partially offset by more favorable prices for commodities, including beef and cooking oil, as well as full utilization of chicken. Cost of labor was 25.3%, 180 basis points higher than the prior years. Last year, we benefited from temporary relief of $17 million, which translates into 
70 basis on margin impact. Two other key factors that impacted labor cost comparison were, one, mid-single digit wage increase for frontline staff due to annual wage adjustment, and two, normalized staff, staffing level at our store compared to the pandemic last year. These were partially offset by sales and leveraging. Occupancy and other was 26.6%, 40 basis point lower than the prior year, benefiting from improvement in rent and depreciation expenses. We continue to secure more favorable rental terms for our new stores. Lower depreciation resulted from lower upfront investment and store portfolio optimization. It's important to note that 45% of our stores have been built after 2019. This was partially offset by lapping of $30 million in rental relief and austerity measure associated with pandemic last year. GNA expenses increased 14% year over year in constant currency, mainly from higher accrual of performance-based incentives. And to a lesser extent, mere increases and higher travel expenses from the resumption of business travel. Offering profit was $323 million, increasing 9% in constant currency. Excluding $30 million in temporary relief received last year, adjusted offering profit to 21% in constant currency. Our effective tax rate was 27.5%. We continue to expect our full year effective tax rate to be around 30%. Net income was $244 million and diluted EPS was 58 cents, both increasing 18% in reported currency. Excluding the foreign exchange impact, net income increased 26% in diluted EPS, 27% in constant currency. We generated $410 million in operating cash flows and $243 million in free cash flow in the third quarter. We returned $211 million to shareholder in cash dividends and share repurchase in the quarter, on track to return $600 to $800 million for the full year 2023. Our balance sheets remain strong with around $4.2 billion in net cash position by the end of the third quarter. Now let's turn to our outlook. Regarding store opening, we opened 500 net new stores in the quarter and 1,155 net new stores year to date. We are on track to meet our 2023 full year target of 1,400 to 1,600 net new stores. The new store payback period for our KFC and Pizza Hut store remains healthy at two years and three years respectively. With our healthy new unit payback, together with flexible formats and modules, we are confident to reach 20,000 stores by 2026 as we unveil at our investor day. Looking ahead, the fourth quarter is seasonally a small quarter for both sales and profit. On the sales front, since the late September, we have observed softening demand, which extended to October. Consumers have become more value conscious. We have been focusing on food innovations and widening pricing ranges to tap into underserved markets to drive growth. Regarding margins, sales remain the biggest factor. Fluctuations in sales may have a pronounced impact on margins in the fourth quarter. As a reminder, in the fourth quarter last year, we also received 26 million in temporary relief, which we do not expect to repeat this year. We also anticipate wage inflation of mid-single digits and returning to more normalized staffing levels at our stores. Just a reminder, in the fourth quarter last year, we experienced labor shortage due to widespread COVID infections. The post-pandemic economic recovery is shaping up to be a wave-like and nonlinear process. So we will maintain our focus on driving sales and cost efficiency. However, the overall trend towards recovery is evident this year, and many of our performance metrics are setting new records. We have demonstrated our ability to quickly adapt to changing consumer preferences and seize opportunities 
under different market conditions. We are confident that the successful execution of our RGM 2.0 strategy will help us expand our stock portfolio, grow sales, and boost profit, delivering sustainable value creation and long-term returns to shareholders. With that, I will pass you back to Michelle. Michelle. Thanks, Andy. Now we'll open the call for questions. In order to give more people the chance to ask questions, please limit your question to one at a time. Zach, please start the Q&A. Thank you. If you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. If you wish to cancel your request, please press star 2. If you're on a speakerphone, please pick up the headset to ask your question. Your first question comes from Michelle Cheng from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, Joy and Andy. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my question is still about uh, the competition. Uh, especially you mentioned that uh, uh, the, the trend turned softer uh, since the end of the September. So can you share with us uh, how, uh, how, how do you see the competition landscape involved? And also um, uh, with this value campaign, how should we think about the balance between uh, the, the, uh, the top line growth and also the uh, full cost control? Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, regarding the competition, we we see it as a positive uh, trend and sign because despite sort of concern towards the macro uh, situation in China uh, in the media, in reality, both international and domestic players are investing aggressively in our industry. Uh, that shows that, you know, these players, com competitors, are, are voting with their money and voting with their feet. Um, and that's consistent to our view towards the, uh, the business and our industry in China, particularly for the chain store uh, business model. Um, on top of that, we see very vibrant uh, competition in the, in the lower tier city. Again, uh, that is good because um, if you remember back to our investor day, we have very aggressive store opening uh, plans, especially in the lower tier city. And that resonates well with our view that there's a lot of opportunity in the lower tier cities. Uh, so, so, you know, we, we, we're quite happy to see that. And then when it comes to the point about value-driven uh, consumer, um, we have been uh, a player that has benefited from the more cautious and more rational uh, spending for the consumers. So we, are, we are a fast food company. Uh, when, when customer becomes more value-driven, it's good for us. As far as we have the capability to to deliver, and we do. And it has it has been a consistent uh, focus for our company to focus not only value but innovative products and fun experience because value itself is never enough for our customers. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. And you can see that in this quarter and in the past many years, um, we have been very consistent with our ticket average. Um, with the up and down, our ticket average compared to the last, you know, uh, sort of more stable year, 2019, is, is still up uh, a little bit because we, we are very careful about it with KFC um, price increase every year and, and Pizza Hut uh, during the turnaround time um, for the for the original product, we kind of keep the price the same, but then we get a bit more opportunity with the new product. But the ticket average has been relatively stable, and even in the last quarter, you can see we have very healthy growth of transaction TC. And in our business, TC growth is, is so good. It, I mean, it cannot be better to have TC growth. So it shows that uh, we, we react very quickly, and we are very agile, and we get the sales. Last but not the least, while 
we are doing all this innovative product. Uh, we 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 deliver value uh, products or challenges today. We are able to protect our margin with our innovations and value campaign, and that is very important. In fact, our year-to-day margin has already exceeded that of 2019, which is you know pre-pandemic. Um, you know, there's some movement. I mean, Andy, I'm sure. Um, and it will go through it later on. There's a movement between the different lines of cost structure, but the restaurant margin, that's what we protect. We, we reduce the rent, we reduce the O and O, and then we put the money into food and to service, uh, to serve our customers. So net net, uh, competition for us is, is good because we see uh, it's a vote of confidence for our industry and our market. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Joy. That's very clear. Your next question comes from Lynn CG from CICC. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Joy and Andy. Uh, so I have one question regarding the margin. Uh, so Andy have mentioned the reasons behind the margins year over year change. Uh, but if we compare Q3 with the same quarter in 2019, um, our revenue increased 26%, but operating profit only increased 8%, uh, which is quite different with Q1 and Q2. Uh, so could you please help us, uh, help us better underst uh, understand this? Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you for your questions. And so as you mentioned, you know, if you look at the year over year comparisons, uh, you definitely need to take out the impact uh, you know, from the temporary release last year. Uh, you know, and when we compare to, you know, 2019, uh, you know, obviously, you know, over the past few years, we continue to see, uh, you know, the labor costs uh, that, uh, that was increasing, uh, you know, over the past few years. Uh, but we're able to partially offset that uh, by improvement in our O&O, uh, which is you know, occupancy and other expenses. Uh, and then, you know, if you look at, you know, by item, uh, you see that COS is actually pretty stable. Around 31 percent. Uh, our COS, as mentioned, because of wage inflation and a high mix of uh, uh, delivery, uh, we have seen you know some increase there. Uh, however, on the O2O side, uh, we are much better, uh, mainly benefiting from stock flow optimizations uh, and rent negotiations and better lease terms. Uh, and we also uh, have other initiatives. Uh, to rebase our cost structure, uh, to possibly offset that, uh, you know, if you look at the, the same store sales, which is about 90% uh, level of the 2019. Now, looking at, um, you know, as we, we mentioned a little bit earlier, looking ahead in the fourth quarter, uh, quarter fourth quarter is a you know, smaller quarter for us in terms of sales and profit. And so, uh, as we have mentioned, we have seen some softening demand uh, since September. So, sales fluctuations uh, would have a more pronounced impact. Uh, on the possibility and margin. Now, um, again, in the fourth quarter, compared to last year, uh, we, last year we received $26 million of uh, uh, temporary relief, which we do not expect to repeat this year. Now, um, in terms of wage inflation, let me just repeat it again, single digit uh, wage inflation, uh, normalization of staffing levels at our store. Longer term, as we have mentioned our investor day, uh, we, you know, our goal is to maintain a stable margin and potentially ex and improve it over time. Um, you know, obviously we have to work hard uh, to continue to offset wage inflation impact every year and potentially commodity inflation in the long term. Uh, it's important to keep you know a short term and long term balance uh, in mind. Uh, you know, we will continue to benefit from cost structure rebasing efforts that uh, will stay in place for a long time. Uh, for example, high variable rent. Uh, you know, uh, our mega store restaurant uh, staff sharing program. Uh, we also have uh, more flexible and uh, lower investment for our store model. So uh, we will maintain you know, our discipline in, in, in cost efficiencies and also uh, continue to improve productivity. That's how we look at the margins in both short term and long term. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Your next question comes from Christine Tank from UBS. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, management. Um, I actually uh, have a question which is also related to competition, but I want to ask more details specifically uh, in terms of this uh, Chinese style burger. 
uh, I think um, uh, in the investor day um, in Xi'an, your uh, KFC um, management actually shared with investor uh, KFC's plan to launch uh, the Chinese uh, style uh, burger uh, products uh, in the very near uh, future. So can management share with us um, uh, the timetable as well as um, uh, more specifics uh, uh, about this product in terms of price uh, strategy, product strategy uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we actually have test launched this uh, particular product in three provinces already, uh, Jiangxi, Fujian in particular. Uh, so it's, it's interesting that we, we test launch it in, not in Guangzhou, Beijing, or Shanghai. Uh, we do it in sort of uh, second tier cities, and uh, the, the the progress has been has been good, and uh, we are you know we we are happy with the result, and we continue to work on a plan, and then uh, move move to next stage uh, when when and when we are ready. Uh, the price point is 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 competitive, uh, it's very affordable, um, and you know it is it's one of our strategies that for the lower tier city. Uh, we have slightly different product and a more uh, flexible um, pricing, uh, but at the same time, we still maintain the margin uh, for the for the business. Uh, but it's going well. I taste the product myself; it tastes great. Um, so, so uh, hopefully next time uh, we we can get it closer to to Hong Kong, where you can uh, <laughs> you don't have to travel that far to try it. Thank you, Christine. Your next question comes from Chen Luo from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, Joe yeah, and Andy. So my question is also on competition. In fact, last time in Xi'an, uh, I also raised a question on testing and the likes of uh, TikTok coupons. And uh, I think given uh, our current value campaign and our initiatives to uh, broaden our price range as well as to sell more coupons on TikTok. Do you think that the ticket average decline that we saw in Q3 could actually extend into the coming few quarters? And would the ticket count increase can be enough to offset the ticket average decrease? Uh, lastly, uh, in terms of our food paper costs as potential sales, uh, do you think that in the near term, it could be under some pressure on a year-on-year -year basis into the coming few quarters? Thank you. Thank you, Watson. Let me just uh, point out that um, the ticket average compared to last year is not exactly the best comparison uh, because last year is during the pandemic. Ticket average is unusually high because people are locked down at home, and when they order, they order big, big ticket size, right? What is more comparable is we look at the ticket average compared to uh, sort of the more normal year. Uh, although we are, we are, you know, our business is very different compared to 2019, uh, but we can compare the ticket average with 2019. The ticket average is still slightly higher 2019. So that is sort of more normal. So I ask uh, our investor not to be overly concerned about the ticket average drop compared to last year. And usually, when our sales move, uh, the, the more more sort of more focused number is always the transaction TC. And the fact that our TC grow at uh, almost double digit is, is a good sign. So, so in our business, over many many years, just go beyond one quarter, go through the you know five years or ten years, you will see our ticket average is always rather stable. So that's uh, hopefully address your concern about the ticket average. And go on. Yeah, okay. let, let, let me just uh, address the both TA. I, as I, I try to, you know, in the preparing month, try to decompose, you know, what is, you know, driving the, the TA. Obviously, you know, promotion is a part of that, but it's a very, it's only one of the, right? Uh, if you look at, for, for example, for KFC, uh, KFC uh, today, the TA is still higher than, you know, what we have seen in 2019, as Joey mentioned. Uh, and, and uh, you know, part of that is, you know, delivery mix, right? You know, we, we have high delivery mix compared to 2019. Uh, and then, you know, if you look at compared to last year, uh, we also will decline in, or, or decline in the mix uh, for delivery as P 
people returning to the store. And so that would have an impact, you know, on, you know, the, the TA because, you know, the delivery TA for, you know, KFC uh, obviously is higher than, you know, the dine-in uh, you know, component. Uh, the other one is, you know, if you look at, uh, you, know, uh, you know, KFC, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, we also mentioned about breakfast, you know, day part, right? So, you know, uh, last year, because of the pandemic, uh, you know, the breakfast day part was impacted uh, more so than the other day part. Uh, with the rebounds in, you know, breakfast uh, day part, we, you know, and which, you know, tend to also have more TA, uh, you know, so the, the, the increase in traffic for, for breakfast day part would also have impact on that. So there's a number of components. Uh, and if you look at our sale ads, you will notice that it's actually very stable, right? Compared to last year, only 40 basis point difference. Compared to 2019, 10 basis points. It's almost flat line, right? So, so we have ability to, you know, manage, you know, the, Overall, you know, our possibilities, uh, our, our margins, uh, with, you know, with different, you know, driver for TA. So. Um, just come back to a lot to your food paper cost. I mean, uh, I think we have shared in our investor day that we've been managed, we've been able to manage the food paper cost at a very stable number over many years. Um, when, when there's some, uh, factors driving up the food cost, um, well, such as commodity mm -hmm. in, uh, inflation, yeah. we are able to deliver a very stable cost because of our innovations and using all parts of chicken and being flexible with our supply chain. Uh, so we are always um, uh, quite quite stable here. And I keep reminding our team internally the the, the problem the food paper cost become a problem is when it becomes too low. That means that we are not giving the value for money, uh, the, 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 the quality of food and the volume of food to customers. Uh, so so it, it, it's a relatively um, stable percentage for the food paper cost over the many years. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Joey and Mandy. Uh, and so we also have confidence in the management ability to stay agile and take the right measures to address competition and further win share. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Your next question comes from Wilkin Tong from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hey, sorry, this is Lillian from Morgan Stanley. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question um, again on margin side, um, but uh, in different aspects. Uh, um, I think despite all this um, losing the subsidy impact and uh, normalization of labor, um, staffing to stores, um, is there any impact from acceleration of stock expansion to margin? Because uh, I think going forward we're gonna keep up uh, this expansion pace. So should we kind of rethink about the margin base uh, given uh, such a situation? Uh, just wanted to really kind of get some uh, color on how to quantify the impact of uh, faster unit expansion to margin. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lillian. Um, you know, so when we look at, you know, our net new store opening, uh, you know, they continue to be very healthy. Uh, you know, if you look at the overall cash payback period, for our new store opening, uh, it's still three years for KFC and three years for Pizza Hut. In fact, as we mentioned, the small store model actually you know, performs even better. Uh, now, if you look at you know how they ramp up, obviously there's a ramp up period for you know the newer store. Uh, we have mentioned large majority of our new store uh, actually break even you know in the first three months, and they continue to ramp up you know through the years. Uh, you know, it may have a short-term impact when it just open, you know, because it's ramping up sales and margins tend to be lower, but uh, they tend to be, you know, very healthy uh, in terms of unit economics uh, as, you know, they progress uh, and, and to, you know, a year or two uh, from the opening. So uh, we, there's no change in the way we look at small opening. Uh, you know, you know, important thing, uh, the important indicator for us really is to look at, you know, how the new store are performing in terms of cash payback, uh, in terms of you know, unit economics, and as long as those are good, we'll continue to stick with our plan. Uh, and as we mentioned, we have been very disappointed about store opening. Uh, it's driven by, you know, uh, our, you know, investment uh, models and then also from ground up from our, our market. So 
So we have the automatic acceleration and deceleration based on the performance of the slope. Thank you, Andy. Julian, thank you. Your next question comes from Anne Ling from Jefferies. Please go ahead. Hey, hi, hi, um, hi, everyone. Thanks for taking my call. Um, uh, questions, you know, regarding the current trading environment. Um, uh, you, got, you guys mentioned about like you know being a little bit softer and um, and with like you know self fluctuation. Would you like you know elaborate a little bit on that? Is it like you know you're talking about like you know post festive event that there is a um, there is a fall off in terms of sales performance, regardless of like you know any like um, promotion or innovative product that you launch, um, or is it because like you know certain day part that you noticed that didn't really like you know um, perform as expected maybe like you know um, or, or a certain like you know geographical area uh, like you know we'd love to hear a little bit more about like you know uh, what drives the, the softness you know is it like um, uh, is there any like, anything that we can do about that yeah thanks sure and um, so 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 at the high level I mean some of us widespread um, you know particularly July there's some pent up demand so as I mentioned earlier, you know, transportation helped the traffic, you know, increase 50% year over year, which is really a good sign. And then comes to the just uh, uh, recent uh, national holiday in during the first half of October. It's quite interesting here actually. Um, we we observe sort of first half and second half during the national holiday because this year particularly this year, the national holiday at the beginning is at the same time as mid-autumn festival. So we see softness during the first half because after three-year pandemic, mid-autumn festival, for Chinese people, what, what do we do? Go home. Uh, so, so, you know, the first half of the holiday, we see massive number of customers going home, uh, go back to see their families so to spend time with them. So the demand was soft. And then by second half of the holiday, after seeing mom and dad, I, I think people decided, still decided I want to travel a little bit. So the second half of the October festival, actually the, the, tra the, the traffic picked up. So, so that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, 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 that's a little bit of this, uh, uh, you know, natural, natural human behavior happening during the national holiday, during mid of the festival. Um, that's the point one. Point two is in terms of the consumption, uh, cautious spending, uh, we do see we do see customer uh, spending a bit less on the premium product. Although our premium burger, our premium product and pizza still are doing quite well, but you know that that's that little trend going. And then it comes to the third third point is what are we going to do about it? Well. We, we have been uh, working on, and, and we, we have been doing it quite, quite well, actually, with pretty good result is widening the price range. So it's not only the bottom, the top bit, because we serve very large customer base, and there's always some customer who want to treat themselves, the same customer who want to treat themselves during certain time. So, you know, the, the premium beef burger, et cetera. Uh, we do that, but at the same time, we also uh, enrich entry price offering. Uh, pizza Hut, the pizza is a good example. Uh, we have we have uh, uh, sort of single digit revenue coming from pizza below 50 RMB, and in fact, this is a very big segment for both international and domestic players. We, we, we see this is a big opportunity here. So, you know, you can imagine we are going to have more and more product in this particular segment. Not only the below 50 RMB pizza, but also single person meal. Because for Pizza Hut business, our business model, our average, uh, average number of customer per transaction is over two people. Well, that shows that we have the opportunity to serve the one person meal as well. And, and, and we see good progress in it and we could do more and get more market share in the one person meal uh, sector. And then for KFC, uh, we also uh, you know, continue to work on the 
the choices of product uh, at the enterprise offering to capture untapped potential of customers, particularly those in the lower tier cities. Uh, so, you know, we can operate at a wide price range uh, all the way to tier six city. And that's what we do. And therefore, we see very good, very good uh, traffic growth. On top of that, in terms of the state part, um, uh, uh, we they, uh, we they are still doing better than we can. Uh, and why the weekend traffic is still a bit soft, and that has a lot of, you know, reasons behind it. But the point is, our focus on the whole chicken, which is mainly at-home consumption product, our focus on certain other products uh, to, to support the uh, weekday uh, traffic. Uh, we're doing the right thing, and we see very good results from, from customers. Um, and therefore, for quarter three, we deliver record uh, revenue, record profit. Uh, but, you know, of course, the biggest uh, challenge for us is the foreign exchange that eat up 6% of our, of our revenue and profit, which is a problem. Uh, but in constant currency, you know, this, uh, we are doing, doing quite well. Um, so we would, will continue to, to focus on the few things that I mentioned. Um, really good product and very good price and good experience, but still protect the margin for the investors and shareholders. Thank you, Anne. Got it, got it. And uh, can I ask another question, you know, regarding the franchise business? Um, we talk, uh, talk a lot, you know, about, um, about this, you know, um, during the investor day. Um, can you, like, you know, share with us, like, you know, the latest update with your, your, your captive um, uh, franchise, you know, i.e., like, you know, those specialty, uh, th- those hos- hospital, you know, um, uni and, um, and also, like, you know, the highway um, centers? When w- will we see the, the ramp up on the franchise business? Right. So, um, you know, if you, you know, I'll just be quick about this one. Uh, you know, as we look at the, you know, third quarter, for example, you know, our franchise, uh, you know, number of new franchises is growing, you know, pretty fast. Uh, it's, you know, like 20, 20% plus compared to last year. And so, you know, like for new store opening. So, so I think we're making progress there. Uh, but obviously, you know, things is not going to happen overnight. Uh, it's going to come to ramp. Uh, so that's how we look at it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Your next question comes from Ethan Wang from CLSA. Please go ahead. Hi, Joey. Hi, Andy. Um, so my question is on the same sales. sales. Um, so we see that tickets, ticket price at KFC and Pizza has declined, but I guess that is understandable with uh, China's consumption space and consumption space competition. And, um, yeah, it, it's good to do more promotions if you have more traffic. So it's, it's always a balancing act. But I just wonder um, um, if we decrease um, ticket, uh, ticket sales and maybe prioritize on the traffic, um, is that going to, like, um, cause some pressure on um, uh, future um, margin, especially from labor, because if, if with more people, we need to have more staff, but uh, with every order, the ticket price comes lower. We understand that's the impact from the delivery, but just want to understand what have some more color uh, on the thinking on, on this trend going forward. Thank you. Okay. So let me try to address that. And then, um, so in terms of uh, the TA, I think, you know, there's a couple of questions concerning TA. Uh, let, let me try to, you know, help folks understand a little bit, you know, uh, more in detail. Uh, again, you know, if you look at, you know, the, for example, KFC, uh, TA, shift, uh, there are three sort of, like, key components to it. Obviously, a uh, number of people have mentioned, you know, uh, traffic driving promotion activities. Uh, but that's only, you know, part of the story, and, you know, it's not the even main part of that. We also have the lower delivery mix shift, right? So last year, during the pandemic, we have seen, you know, very high delivery, and, you know, when this delivery comes back, especially, you know, what we call, like, group uh, ordering delivery last year, right, group buy delivery. Um, and so when, when, when this year, when things return to more normal, we do see, you know, the delivery mix uh, to be, you know, slightly lower than last year. And so that's normal because people are coming back to the store. Uh, and so, so that's about impact. The other one is, as we mentioned, you know, the certain day part, right, uh, the office shift would also have impact on that. Uh, for breakfast, as we mentioned, generally we have a lower PA. And so when that's growing faster, then you would also see, you know, a, a TA impact uh, on the overall KFC TA. Uh, same for Pizza Hut, uh, maybe slightly differently, uh, as we have mentioned. 
uh, you know, besides of you know the promotional activities, we are actually by design trying to target you know and tap market which is you know below 50 RMB you know segment, uh, which is very underserved by uh, Pizza Hut, but you know is a very you know big part of the pizza market overall, which is you know like obviously right now a uh, number of you know players are, are active in there. So we want to penetrate that market. Uh, the other one you know for for TA uh, for for for, for Pizza Hut, as Joey mentioned, is our purposeful, uh, you know, targeting of single-person news sets. Uh, you know, uh, KF, uh, Pizza Hut, well, KFC, if you look at a TA and then you look at Pizza Hut, uh, you will see that, you know, Pizza Hut always have high TA. Uh, and then, you know, uh, and then a part of that is because uh, it's in group dining and also in family dining. Uh, so, you know, when we have products that are designed particularly for, you know, single person use that, especially working lunch and whatnot. You're going to see, you know, the TA shifting there. Uh, and 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 finally, as we you look at even before the pandemic, we have done a purposeful job to actually increase the value proposition to you know consumer. Uh, one of the biggest uh, you know challenge and for for Pizza Hut, you know, before the revitalization program was that you know the, the you know the value proposition uh, to the consumer. And so we've been working very hard and hold the price stable and and whatnot. To drive that, and so so that's why you know by design doing that because you know when Pizza is going to try to expand and address a bigger bigger uh, customer base, uh, you know you're going to have a wider pricing range, and so that's why you know you know you continue to expect TA over there have some movement there. So that's a lot of components there uh, for our strategy. Um, but the key point is that despite all that stuff that going on, uh, you see that you know our COS is very stable, uh, you know 31%. Right, because we have product innovation, uh, we have a very strong supply chain managing that. Um, you know, uh, so 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 you know, overall, that's how we want to keep a balance between you know driving you know the traffic, expanding our addressable market, uh, and at the same time maintaining our TA. Now, obviously, for COL, the biggest concern on the long term is you know the demographic change in China and whatnot, and so. Um, you know, it's very important for us to continue to invest in automation, digital, uh, and to improve, you know, our um, operations so that we can continue to improve the labor productivity, you know, of our workforce. And we've been quite successful doing that before the pandemic. Uh, and coming out from the pandemic, we're also pretty stable at about 25, 26%. Um, and, you know, that's the, the thing that in the long run, as you mentioned, trying to maintain the overall margins and expand it potentially over time. Thank you. Maybe I just add some color on the COL side in particular. Um, if we look beyond just one quarter, we look, look, look at our COL over the last few years, as we share in the investor day, when we have a few thousand so, six, seven thousand so, we have 430,000 people, or 450,000 people actually. Now we have 14,000 so, almost double. We still only have 430,000 people. Uh, so, as Andy mentioned, we use, you know, automation, digitization to manage uh, labor costs. Uh, when it comes to sort of um, uh, more, uh, uh, when it comes to handling the promotion and, and, and while managing the COL, well, as I mentioned in my prepared remark, uh, we tend to pick those products that, is, that utilize the existing ingredients and that they are very easy to make. And we're very careful about, you know, maximum number of items that the staff can handle in our store. And that's why having an amazing, uh, I would say second to none operation team is important. Uh, we, we do have pretty uh, dedicated and, and good balance of how many items we sell in the store and what's the impact on the COL. And most important, what's the quality of food? Uh, that we can uh, protect in order to deliver uh, in the short term and long term. Thank you, Ethan. Got it. That's fair. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from Xiao Po Wei from City. Please go ahead. Good morning, Julie and Andy. I have a quick follow-up question on restaurant margin. Um, in the third quarter, did you see any widened divergence of the restaurant margin of high-tier city versus low-tier city? And also, Andy, in the prepared remarks, explained a lot about uh, we, can, we are having concession rent for new store, etc. Uh, looking forward, shall we expect all 
occupancy and other expenses to sales ratio to keep low because in the past two years, this has been very good factor to mitigating other inflation component in the restaurant market. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, so in terms of, you know, uh, the different variants, I think, you know, there's not material uh, changes to the way, you know, margin actually pan out, as we have mentioned before. You know, uh, obviously, in the tier one city, tier two cities, the high tier cities, uh, you know, generally, you know, those stores have higher uh, throughput at the store. Uh, and, but, you know, generally, you know, you have, uh, you know, a slightly lower margin because high cost, labor and rent. Uh, and then in low T cities, you know, you, although you have a, a smaller throughput, you know, through the store, uh, generally costs are lower, uh, labor and all that. So, uh, so, so, so the margin is slightly higher in the lower tier cities. Uh, but on all, you know, because also the investment, after investment is different, uh, in different tiers. So we end up, you know, have a pretty, you know, good payback period, uh, for both, you know, the top tier and the lower tier cities. Uh, and so, so, so that's you know, in terms of you know the the, the variance between uh, margins in different tier cities. Now, uh, in terms of O and O, uh, you know, uh, I think as we have mentioned, you know, obviously last year we have some temporary relief, but uh, but overall, like you know, O and O, even you know, including those, you see continued improvement there. Um, you know, those those contract, long term contracts, so when you get you know favorable long term lease, you get favorable long term impact. Um, and then we also have other cost structure, you know, initiative and portfolio optimization. So um, I think, you know, O and O uh, improvement would stick, uh, but you know, obviously, you know, that's also, you know, limit in terms of how low we can get, right? No one's going to give a free rent. Um, but but I think, you know, in the long run, I think we'll we'll continue to see, uh, you know, pretty pretty healthy O and O uh, uh, as percentage of sales. Thank you. Thanks, Abba. There are no further questions at this time. Thank you for uh, joining the call today. For further questions, please reach out through the contact information in our earnings release and our, our website. Goodbye. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes our conference for today. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.